earlier I asked you about ketones and the possibility of fueling cancer, as you're talking there, it got me thinking about the specific benefit of having ketones in the body, in the blood as a cancer patient. And you gave some really great nuance there of ketone esters and to stay away yeah. from those until further research, at least when it comes to cancer. And you gave or good the, options smaller with the doses MCT. Too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you got into the nuance there and I think that was really, really important. And then we know we can still do the MCTs or the ketone salts. But what yeah. I'm getting at with all this is there, what is the therapeutic benefit? We know it's going to change the ratio of the GKI when we have exogenous mm -hmm. ketones. What are they doing specifically to cancer? Yeah, very good question. So we design all our experiments to test the question, uh, is it carbohydrate restriction associated with the ketogenic diet or is it, is it the ketones themselves? That actually had the therapeutic effect and one of the first publications we published in american physiology journal was on what's called central nervous system oxygen toxicity or cns oxygen toxicity and hyperbaric oxygen is something that i'd like to talk about too uh but when you go inside a hyperbaric chamber or <laughs> let's use the context of a navy seal using a closed circuit rebreather when he dives down to 50 feet on 100 percent oxygen and gets down to you know 2.5 atmospheres or below then that oxygen can trigger a seizure a grand mal seizure and uh so we have a model system in the lab where we replicate this in rats and I was highly skeptical that giving exogenous ketones could mitigate oxygen toxicity seizures. So work was done by the military to show that if you fast 24 or 36 hours, but for a rat, that's like me fasting like three to five days, that increases the latency to seizure more than any anticonvulsant drug. So this really inspired me to go down that path. I was like, let's do the ketogenic diet. The military was like, no, we're not going to give a high fat diet, but we'll fund like a ketone ester. We want the ketogenic diet in a pill. So I tested beta hydroxybutyrate monoester. I tested 1,3-butane diol. It had no effect. So I was thinking, okay, Keto adaptation needs to happen before you get the anti-seizure effects. You know, you really need to suppress insulin. And but then I worked with a chemist. His name is Patrick Arnold. You know, he's got a he's got a Wikipedia page you can read about him. And he's a brilliant chemist, but I couldn't get the molecule that I wanted to synthesize in academia. So I was able to get it synthesized and it was a molecule that elevated beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate more or less in a one-to-one -one ratio. And I was given the recipe by Dr. Henri Bruningrabber, who ran the NIH metabolomics core at Case Western. So I got the recipe, we synthesized it. I gave it the, mo I gave the, the monoester of acetoacetate to, and it's a 1,3-butane dial acetoacetate monoester, and then, then we made the diester. Then this worked remarkably well. The animals were consuming a high carbohydrate rat chow. We gavaged, which means we tube fed them 30 minutes prior to five, five atmospheres of oxygen, which induces a seizure pretty quick, uh, like five minutes. And then when we, when we gave them the ketone ester, they were in you know, they're in the chamber for like an hour. And actually we had, we went to 90 minutes, which uh, then you start to get pulmonary oxygen toxicity. Like it's almost like we couldn't give them oxygen toxicity. It was actually energizing and stabilizing neurotransmission. And it had such a neuroprotective effect. It was almost hard to induce oxygen toxicity seizures. So this made me realize that independent of macronutrient manipulation, we could administer a ketogenic agent, not all ketogenic agents, but this specific ketogenic agent, and ha it has you know an anti-seizure effect. So, uh, so then, I mean, you're asking about the effects on cancer. So we actually formulated various diets, uh, and one of the studies we published in the International Journal of Cancer. Dr. Uh, Poff was the Angela Poff was the first author on that. And I think the title is ketone supplementation decreases metastatic cancer in a metastatic cancer model or something like that. So if you just Google ketone supplement, you know, metastatic cancer, ketogenic, it would come up uh, and it's, we pay for it to be open access. So when we 
when we integrated the ketogenic agents, in this case, it was 1,3-butanediol. And we also did uh, 1,3-butanediol acetoacetate diester, which had a little bit more of an anti-cancer effect, but they both did. And we fed that to the animal, then uh, they lived longer. It increased their, you know, uh, the duration. It decreased tumor growth, and it, we had an enhanced survival. And then we also directly added ketones to the media of brain cancer cells that we were growing. And we looked at proliferation. And so we saw less proliferation and we saw more cell death in the brain tumor cells that we grew in the presence of like two millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, and so beta hydroxybutyrate by itself can decrease glycolysis. Beta hydroxybutyrate has anti-inflammatory effects beta hydroxybutyrate has epigenetic effects through class one and two histone deacetylase enzymes that could further boost endogenous antioxidant capacity and make our healthy cells more robust. And that can, it also, uh, there's probably an antioxidant component to the redox status of the microenvironment of tumors. And then there's the epigenetic effects associated or yeah, directly associated with beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, so I think I think it's multifactorial and what we say pleiotropic effects of ketones. Uh, so I think it's a number of different things working in synergy. Uh, and it may also be due to changing the energetic source of the the mitochondria. So when the mitochondria are burning the ketones for energy or deriving ATP, you know, from them, uh, they produce the mitochondria produce proportionally less superoxide uh, anion. So superoxide anion then gets converted to uh, hydrogen peroxide, and then in the presence of like free iron, you can drive something called the Fenton reaction and produce hydroxyl radical, and then that creates an environment that can fuel cancer. You know, you can damage nucleic acids, membranes, and things like that. So, so you have, and you ask about ketones, what are ketones directly doing? And I think they're doing many different things. They're altering the redox state of the cell. They're changing the bioenergetic capacity. They have profound anti-inflammatory effects. So we published a paper in nature, uh, medicine and, um, that paper, Dr. Deep Dixit from uh, Yale was the the first author on that, and uh, uh, he had he had studied the NLRP3 inflammasome in the context of fasting, and then some of the data that came out of that study showed that beta hydroxybutyrate was very high, and that correlated with the NLRP3 inflammasome suppression. So I actually gave him the supplement and generated the diet for a further study that got published ultimately in nature medicine in 2015, I think that showed that simply feeding food with ketone supplementation suppressed the NLRP3 inflammasome to a similar extent that fasting did. And that NLRP3 inflammasome, when it's activated, sets off uh, a cytokine storm of various, you know, um, uh, IL-1 beta, for example, IL-6, TNF-alpha, and other things, but mostly IL-1 beta. And these things can drive the tumor microenvironment in a way to drive metastasis and invasion. And uh, even if you don't have cancer, the NLRP3 inflammasome can drive the initiation of healthy cells to cancerous cells. And the NLRP3 inflammasome is tightly linked to radiation necrosis and damage downstream damage from radiation uh so all these different things could be factoring in to the patient not only the lowering of glucose and suppression of insulin and associated signaling like igf1 and mTOR but the elevation and sustained elevation of ketones has cellular protection effects and also anti-cancer effects let me give you a hypothetical situation to try and understand this in a practical way Say you have two cancer patients and they both have the same GKI. One is facilitating that with either MCT oil or, or ketone salts, and they're having a little bit more carbohydrate in their diet. 
versus somebody that's doing it strictly dietary. How do you feel about the two different outcomes? Uh, it would be important for both patients to measure insulin. And uh, interestingly enough, and not only me, but when I added carbohydrates back in to my diet, which I do now, I keep almost 100 grams of carbs. When I went from like 25 grams of carbs to 100 grams of carbs a day, but kept my ketones elevated with a ketone salt uh, throughout the day, uh, I felt better. And then I was like, well, I was kind of curious about my insulin level. And then my insulin, my, my insulin level went down <laughs> when I, when I more than doubled my carbohydrates, but actually kept my ketones, you know, elevated a few times throughout the day. And I was very curious about this. And I've had a number of reports. I am positive that if you do a study on you know, with a large group of people, you would see the same thing. And I think what you're seeing is that when you add a little bit of carbs back in, it's reversing some of the physiological, non-pathological insulin resistance. So simply adding a little bit of carbs back in uh, can actually improve insulin sensitivity in some way because it gets uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, it gets GLUT1 transporter, it sort of reactivates and initiates the glycolytic pathway and sustains that pathway. On a strict ketogenic diet, you're basically cutting off that pathway. So insulin's kind of like uh, absent and it's not doing a job. But if you titrate a little bit of carbs back in, then your body's always hungry for carbohydrates. You and then insulin starts to work a little bit better because, you're, you know, I mean, that's the case for me as a healthy individual, uh, I think. So my insulin was cruising about 4.5 and then I added carbs back in and I did it for a month and then I did it again. Then it was 3.3. And I was like, oh, that's probably, that doesn't seem right. And then I did it again. And it was like 3.2. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And then I took some time off, went strict keto again, because I feel great on strict keto, but sometimes like I, I lack a little bit of that drive when I do power lifting or I'm working really hard. And then I got it, got it, uh, did an insulin test again, and I'm back up to like four, 4.2 or something, which is still great, right? But it's suggesting that maybe uh, a high fat ketogenic diet, independent of weight loss or maintenance, you know, basically I'm just maintaining my calories is producing a mild state of physiological insulin resistance. And I think in, in the context of a ketogenic diet, maybe that's favorable because the insulin resistance is pushing your body to more fat oxidation, right? So like your body's like glycolytic pathways are suppressed and the body's like, okay, maybe we just need to release a little bit more insulin to kick up these glycolytic pathways. But then that is not working because you're just not giving glucose as fuel. So you're just making glucose through the glycerol backbone of the triglyceride. So, I mean, this is all like, you know, if a physiologist was listening to this, they would say, yeah, that would probably make sense. And it's just a lot of speculation, but I think there's, I think there's good scientific rationale behind some of these observations. And I think it may be, so if we're talking about the context of the cancer patient, I think a carnivore diet can work. You know, Paleo Medicina, uh, that group in Budapest, Hungary, have done some remarkable work with cancer patients. We flew to Budapest, we met with them, they showed us the data, and I'm convinced that uh, a paleolithic ketogenic carnivore diet is therapeutic for cancer. They convinced me of that, and I'm kind of a bit of a skeptic. So I do think a carnivore diet can be effective for that, but I also think that there are benefits to including a wide variety of plant-based compounds like you know broccoli and cruciferous vegetables and various colorful salads could make up uh and you could get 50 to 75 grams of essentially fiber into the diet and that could be beneficial i do think fiber is overrated uh, i do well without it if i get fiber in the morning or the afternoon it doesn't agree with me so i just like backload all my fiber at the end of the day, typically in the form of like maybe an avocado, a little bit of broccoli and blueberries. If you enjoyed that clip, you're going to want to head over here and catch a full episode. I'll see you over there. These are really important things that an oncologist is never going to tell the patient to do. Hyperglycemia 
and hyperinsulinemia is associated with much greater, sometimes two to three to four fold higher incidence of cancer. But if we had a drug that did this, it would be a blockbuster.